Well, hey there, Gen Xers. Welcome to another interview with Gen X Talking on Being Prepared. I'm Matt Marshall, overall preparedness enthusiast, and we are here to help guide people to respond well and recover faster. Let me introduce my co-host, Ed. Hey, I'm Ed Wasson. Well, in today's show, we have a really interesting fella uh, I've had the pleasure of working with for the past couple of uh, couple of years. Over that time, I've grown to respect where he's coming from, his experiences past and present, we feel can, can really provide some life lessons for our audience. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome to Gen X Talking, Mr. Jim Booth. Jim? Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Welcome, Jim. Jim, would you mind just starting off with a quick, maybe icebreaker, just a couple of minutes, five minutes or so uh, of your life? I know it's really, really difficult to pack that all in together <laughs> into a very, very short time frame, but, but just whatever you th- think might be interesting uh, big points in your life. Sure, not a problem. Uh, first off, thanks, Matt, Ed, for um, having me on today. I, I grew up around the Omaha area in Nebraska did some work on uh, farms in the summer, working in the fields, and I had always wanted to go into the military. And my junior year in high school, I took my ASVAB, went and talked to the Navy recruiter, and they offered me the CB um, uh, occupational field as an electrician, and it kind of fit what I wanted to do. And so two weeks after I graduated high school, I went in the military, where I spent the next 20 years. I got to do some amazing things with that. And I have some regrets as, as I think anybody would. One of my major regrets is not having turned in my application for the army warrant officer program. I I still kind of kick myself for that to this day, but in the end, I got to do some things as a CB that nobody else has ever done. I was in one of the, probably the biggest key and highlight is my time in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba which I've actually been there twice. Uh, I was there in 1992 for six months uh, during the Cuban-Haitian migration. And I got to help support that. Very interesting, the culture, cultural differences, those two different nations. But then I went back in 1999 and I ended up spending five years there. I was there pre and post 9-11. I got to see a base that was being drawn down into what they call the caretaker status, minimal staffing, because the primary mission of the base is migrant operations. The secondary mission was as a recalling station. So ships that would come in could get fuel, food, and some minor repairs. We're on that final phase of drawdown. Uh, when I was there in 1992, the permanent station base population was sitting right at close to eight to 10,000. Just before 9-11 happened, we were down to 2,500 people. Life was was quite amazing there. And the things that we could do, you lived in a fishbowl because you couldn't go anywhere, but in a 27 mile radius, the things that we did there, it it was awesome. You know, we could go deep sea fishing to fish in the bay, snook or, or 35 pound minimum. You know, you you Ed's Ed's sitting here pointing at his shirt, Guantanamo Bay shirt. (laughs) Oh, I I didn't. I did. uh, The the image is so small. I didn't see it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. He's, he's um, trying to be very subtle. This Sorry, is an awesome ahead. story, though. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So then 9-11 happens. I remember that day very distinctively. I was at the elementary school. What I was doing there in, in uh, Cuba is I was maintaining the base communications, either doing a repair on a line or installing a new phone line somewhere in the building. And, and there was a crawl space. And I'm up into this tiny little crawl space. And I get a call over the radio that I needed to go back to the office now. No questions asked. So I crawl back out through my small little 10 by 10 inch by 10 inch hole and, and on my ladder and back I go just in time to see the second plane hit the, hit the other tower. <sighs> That's when the realization happened with that. Being in a critical facility every four hours, we had to, to go in and check on the facility and it was a week long thing. I happened to be on duty that week. So guess what Jim got to do? He got to go um, and wake up every four hours at night and plus work a full time day. It drew hard on me and we ended up having to do some shifting with that. And, and I guess there was a lot of background conversations going on there. I don't know. I wasn't that high a level, but I came back off of um, we went back to the stage for Christmas. And when I came back, that's when I found out exactly what we would be doing. Communications at Gitmo at that time were from the 1980s. And now we find out that we're going to be building up a, a prison, bringing in a, a huge operation and we've got to upgrade 
all of our infrastructure. From January until August, we brought in augmented teams. We had a contract company come in and install a new telephone switch. We had four central stations. So we um, redid all of them, plus put in four remote stations that came off of, off of each one of those exchanges. We installed about 50 miles of fiber optic cable. That means burying it and terminating it. We, we did not contract this out with any major contracting company. We did all of this in-house with National Guard and, and some uh, reserve help and a couple of assets that were already stationed on the base. I can remember for the first four months, I did not get a day off. I was working 10, 12-hour days. And I had a team of four guys and we installed and terminated um, just a little over 250,000 feet of Cat5 cable. And that wow. tested and certified. Uh, we, we installed at the time an OC48 um, fiber distribution system in four different locations. We cut over those four switches. We stood up Camp X-Ray. Yep. Um, you, and if you've seen that, then you've seen my work because um, mm -hmm. I did the communications at Camp X-Ray. I've also done some of the communications at the um, tribunal building and, and all of that occurred. And at the same time, my command was pulling out all the active duty from there, except for the CBs and they were contracting it out. So we also had that going on at that same time. I worked two complete man years, myself and, the, and other members of my team. We worked two man years through 2002. And I also, and my youngest son was born in 2002 as well. All of that happened when they pulled out everybody. We needed um, a concept manager, uh, an EKMS manager. So I filled that role. They had to pull some special permissions because it's not my our normal jobs. There was some fear by the regular Navy and, and those folks in that community when they found out I was taking over a major account. After some conversation with me, they realized due to some of my previous experience in the joint world, ComSec and I aren't aren't such bad friends. So I did that my final year there. Gitmo was probably the most memorable, the most fulfilling time. And next to that would be the four years prior that I spent at JCSE in Tampa, Florida. I, I went to La Maddalena, Italy for a couple of years, ran the IT shop there, settled out in Virginia Beach, retired out of Virginia Beach, and then lived there until I got the call to come down here to Charlotte to work for where I'm working at. Uh, a couple years ago, that's that's me. Wife and kids, as a lot of folks in the military that did some of the uh, the jobs that I did, you um, you end up being married a few times. So I am on my third marriage, and I have kids with my out of my first two marriages. So I have three boys. The oldest is he'll be thirty in April. The middle son he's twenty eight now. My youngest that just went into the army he is. 19. My wife has three children. Uh, her oldest is 35. I think Nikki is 33 and Amanda will be 31. I think that's the way it goes. And, and, and out of those six kids, we have nine grandchildren Wow. Uh, that, that range from the age of Colson will be one in March all the way to Kyrie, who's 10 now. She'll be 11 in September. So nice. you got yeah. a, you got a full broad going on there. We we do. <laughs> so the first the, our first Fourth of July at, at this house we're in now, we had every single person there. Twenty two people. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah, it was it's awesome. A lot, it really a lot was. of fun, right? Trying cool. trying to find space for everybody is a little more difficult uh, with yeah. a two bedroom house. But we are we've got a camper, so we were able to to handle some overflow. So th this is this is actually a good transition because in the last few years, you and your wife, you made a decision to move to a more homesteading type living. So mm -hmm. would you want to share a little bit about that, your homestead and what that decision might have might have been oh, like? Sure. As I was talking about growing up and everything, growing up in Nebraska, detasseling corn and what we called roguing beans or just pulling weeds is really what, all we did. <laughs> I never wanted to have any part of that life ever again. Yeah. Then six or seven years ago, I was like, I'm tired of the city life. I'm tired of this hustle bustle. The house I sold in Virginia Beach was in a, in a development with one, one entrance. And I lived six houses into that entrance of 531 homes. 
I had over 2000 cars pass my house every day. <sighs> it took me an hour and a half to drive 23 miles. I, I was done oh. with it. I wanted out of the city. Yeah. I, I'm not a beach person. I think in the last three years I lived in Virginia beach, I went to the beach three times. My wife is from the Hudson Valley area in New York. And she's always lived in the city. I started taking her camping and she really started liking it. I started taking her on, on hikes on the Appalachian trail, which she's good for like a two day hike, but she's not, she's not going to survive anything more than that. And she'll no, openly no six admit month, it. no six month no, through no, hike. No, no. Okay. She's, right. she's a very visual person. And if the map shows that it's three miles, it should be three miles <laughs> and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be six miles because you're going up and down hills. Funny. Hey, some yeah. people are like that. So she says, if you're ever going to do another hike, that's, it's on your own, which led to conversations of having a lot of property. And we got to looking into this. We've learned the term gentleman's farm, which means that you get all the farming benefits it's just, you're not making any money off of it. It's, it's uh, not your life, but you have all the animals, the garden, and you're doing all of these things. It's just not your business. So to speak. Yeah, right. So we got to talking about it and we started looking at moving into central Virginia, looking at properties. And about the time I got this call, we were seriously, seriously looking. And I actually had a couple of very large properties marked around the Charlottesville area that we were going to start looking at. My son graduated from high school last year. We we're going to sell our house and live in the camper we have now for the last year and a half or so of his high school. We were going to buy a property, go out on the weekends or whatever, pull the camper, go, go fix and do whatever we needed to do. And then go back into town and work until he graduated high school. And then that was going to be our full-time thing. Well, about the time we were getting ready to make all that decision, I get the phone call to come here. It, it was a, it was a big decision to move six hours away from all the grandkids that were used to being around the corner, and and it was rough at the very beginning, but it's it's gotten better. Honestly, we probably see our kids more now than we did living around the corner from. So we started looking in the area. The very first house we looked at is the one we're in now. It's uh, we've got thirty seven acres. I've got a I think it's five acre pasture that is my hay production. Okay. I've got another pasture that's five acres that we kind of use as a go between with the horses. So we, we have two horses. Um, I'll let that one grow for 30 to 45 days. And then I'll send them over there to graze while the other one across the, on the other side of the driveway is growing and send mm -hmm. them over there to graze. And so I got a little bit of that. And in the winter time I have to, to buy hay or, or if I can, which I'm still working on the barter system with this, but get somebody to bail my, my pasture. Yeah. I, I could be self-supportive in that nature. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We, we, we have a Creek um, that is part of our property line. It's about a mile long. I've got uh, about an acre of a pond. Um, it sits right up in the front in the driveway. I don't really get to see it. So it's kind of one of those uh, it's there and I always wanted a pond, but I will, it, in hindsight, it should have been in the back where I could see it and or enjoy it a little bit more than what I do. We found this property. The price point of where we ended up moving at, what we sold our home for and what we bought this for was a difference of $100,000. We're in process of learning as we go. It is a learning process. Yes, I grew up in Nebraska. Yes, I know a few things um, about gardens and, and some livestock and, and things like that, but there's still a learning process. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the term homesteading implies a, a lot of different things and, and most definitely it requires knowledge beyond what a simple growing up on a near a farm or, or yeah. having a garden at home. It, yeah. I, I yeah. really like that term gentleman's farm. Yeah. You know, I've never actually heard that. Yeah, I haven't well, heard that either. But what are, your knowledge, Jim, is so, in that area is a lot more than mine. So I'm Matt and I are talking about this kind of stuff in the possible future. Yeah. So the first time I ever heard the, the term gentleman's farm, I was watching an interview with the actor that plays Negan on The Walking Dead. And mm -hmm. he owns a gentleman's farm in Virginia. And he's and he used that term. I actually had to look it up on the Internet after I heard that, too. So it's from yeah. The Walking Dead. Okay. Yeah, I like yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So we spent the last couple of years getting things ready. So what our ultimate goal is, is to be self-sustaining. Yeah. We don't, 
you know, we go to the store to get the the things that you can't grow, the wheat, the sugar. Okay, um, everybody needs some kind of human interaction. So you go yeah. into town to get that. I, I've been making my own jelly for last four years. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got five different flavors sitting in the house right now. I bought a pressure canner this year. So now I can soup for the first time. I grew butternut squash. I had no idea that one butternut squash plant takes up as much real estate as it does. Yes. So when we talk about learning and I bet we pulled off of just one vine, probably 40 butternut squashes off of it. Yeah. But we made a soup and I canned it. That was hmm. six months ago and uh, everything is still good with it. I've got tomatoes canned that to uh, last me through this season. We also discovered we want to increase the size of our garden. Mm-hmm. Uh, we put a fence around the garden and it was mostly keep the dogs out and we're going to make it bigger. I, I just replaced my my breed of chicken. Um, so I haven't had eggs. I haven't had a chicken laying egg since yeah. September. But I still have eggs. There's a process that you can do to store an egg for up to a year. So you take a big mason jar, you get some pickling lime. There's there, the one key factor that you have to do is you can't wash the eggs upon delivery. So they can't have any excrements or, or any debris on them. You put them in this jar and you can store them up for a year. You just rinse them off? Nope, you don't even rinse them off. So oh. when a chicken lays an egg, they put a natural coating around the mm-hmm. egg and you can actually lay, um, set a fresh egg on the counter for up to 30 days without oh. it going in the refrigerator. And it's okay. fine. Okay. Um, the, the way you can tell an egg is getting old is how flat the yolk is. The yolk doesn't stand straight up. Then the flatter it gets, the older that egg is in this jar in the, in that long-term storage method, there you're only going to get scrambled eggs out of them. They're only going to be good to cook with. Okay. But the flavor with my jarred um, eggs, and you'd never know that they came out of that jar. This is one of the things that I think is so valuable to people. Yeah, They have no idea if it comes in its natural state, which is covered with the, the stuff, the stuff, the yeah. Yeah. From yeah, the the stuff. Birth, then it, it extends that life of them. I, I yep. always thought to myself, though, putting them in that jar with the, the lime in it would make it taste different. No, because of that coating, natural yeah. coating from the chicken. Protects it from the um, taste as well. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So an eggshell is naturally porous, but the film that is on an egg, that coating covers up all those air holes. And, and yeah, it's, yeah, okay. it's, yeah. it's a fine, it's, it's a good egg. I've got 20 chickens sitting in my freezer, um, so I'm good for chicken meat. We took two of them just recently, put them in the pressure cooker and made chicken broth mm-hmm. and then took the chickens out and shredded out the meat and can't. Uh, well, I didn't get to can it. It's in the freezer. But the, the goal was to can that chicken meat. But those are the kind of things that we're doing. And what I did is I went to a larger chicken. I went from a Rhode Island red breed to a Plymouth rock breed. They're, they're a larger chicken. Egg production is about the same. I should be getting eggs any day from them. And yeah. around February timeframe, I'm going to start incubating eggs. And um, it's getting about a 21 day process. So every 30 days, I'll be incubating about 21 eggs or so. I'll start reproducing my own chicken and and being self-sustained. And the goal is to never have to buy chicken again. So So, one one quick question I had around that though, what was it originally that caused the chickens not to lay? That delay is because I bought them as chicks. Yeah. It takes 22 weeks for them to start laying roughly 22 weeks. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, I completely changed out the breed. So I bought my chickens from a company in Texas and they mailed them to me. I went down to the post office. I picked them up and I ordered 12 hens and a rooster. And I ended up with two roosters and 11 hens. Sexing it, I think that the company did an amazing job. 
we learned the hard way. You want to try and maintain about a 10 hen to one rooster ratio. We, we had a almost two hens to a rooster ratio. Oh, and wow. yeah. it's mm-hmm. a brutal situation. The roosters are brutal to a yeah. hen. Yeah, and right. when you got six roosters in one hen, you feel sorry for a hen. And that, yeah, I lot, think that's, a lot of feathers lost in that type of situation. Uh, there yeah. is. And not only are they lost, but they never grow back. And so the hens were getting, getting abused. I killed off all the roosters, which was my mistake. I should have kept one of them. And mm. so that, that's another reason to force me to have to change out my flock. So if it's the one rooster to 10 hens now, uh, spo- uh, that's a good ratio. Is that, that is a good ratio. So that's where they're coming up with the uh, expression hen picked. Yes. So what a ro- what the roosters did is they t- get a hen. One of them would get on a hen, and then all the other five roosters would circle that hen. And when one hit, when one rooster was done, the other one, another one would instantly jump back, jump on, yeah. until all six of them had taken their turn with one hen. That's the bad scene on that side, and then on the other side, if it's one rooster to the ten hen, and that's a the tables are turned, and it's those guys that that are are busy and probably exhausted and and that's actually more what you 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 need yes yeah chickens are interesting just happens to be one of the farm animals that i'm extremely familiar with Mm, so it was a natural transition for me to bring chickens in and and raise them up i know people who will give a chicken all their table scraps and then you've got people that turn chickens into pets my grandkids when they come to the house they know you don't go in the chicken coop those are not pets they are food When you're eating breakfast tomorrow morning, it's because of them and you need to leave them alone. You need to quit stressing them out. When a chicken gets stressed, their production goes down, right? It does go down, but then also you get blood in your eggs. So when a chicken is stressed, the yolk splits and separates a little bit from, from the white part there. And it causes blood vessels to break and you get red spots in your chicken eggs. My wife would not eat eggs when she saw that in the beginning. She she's all right with it now. A lot of people have that false sense of what the visual should be. And this is actually what it really is if you do it on your own. Um, chickens are very easy to maintain. We, we put shavings to kind of help with the um, cleanliness of the coop. Yeah. Oh. And about once a month, we'll go in and, and clean it out and wherever their messes are piled up or whatever. And the shavings start getting kind of messier and, you know, we'll go in and we'll clean that out and refresh it. It takes a couple hours. You got to feed them once a week. I've taken five gallon buckets and I've created feeders and waters out of it. But if we do need to go away for a couple of days, it's not an issue. They've got plenty of water in the summertime. They'll drink about 10 gallons of water a week. This time, now that it's gotten cool, 10 gallons last about two and a half weeks. We go out and, and we'll throw just to add some protein into their diet, you know, some cracked corn. We'll throw about a quart in there for them a night. They love it. Um, yeah. Any leftover bread, we'll throw leftover bread. I, I'll throw grains and fruits in there, but I know people who throw cooked chicken nuggets and throw the eggshells back in there. Mm-hmm. I, I don't like doing that. Um, it, you, they can eat their shells if, as long as you wash them and no harm, no foul. And it adds calcium into their diet and it makes the shells stronger for some chickens. But with my Rhode Island Reds, I didn't need to yeah. do anything special to their diet. The The shells uh, were fine. So, so you got a chicken in the hen house picking out dough? Yes, I do. I sure do. Um, <laughs> about once a week, um, she, they, they pick out dough uh, and, they, and they get going. Yep. <laughs> so I got, road- that, I got the reference. I got the reference. <laughs> you think in that community with those people if if we were to try to eventually get to that stage of life but also still have omaha steaks come once a week i i, I, really I mean i'm serious that's a I serious like omaha question steaks. yeah uh, i hey no, they're and, good stuff and i think that there is an environment for that but here's where i i see the downfall of something like that so we okay. have some farms in our area that do raise cattle and and sell off the meat because you're you're raising on such a smaller scale 
Yeah. Your, your cost per pound is higher when people are in that smaller, like micro farm kind of, I guess yeah. would be a way to say it. I've, I've found where the meat prices are three or four, four dollars more a pound than on the commercial side. Okay. Um, is the quality any better? No, I don't, I don't feel that the quality is any better. So but you could be kind of hurting the community. I don't know if you would be hurting the community. I think the community would have to make a different adjustment. The idea of an Omaha steaks kind of, of aspect, I don't think you'd see that as much as, hey, Ed, um, I've got half a hog, but I don't have any, any, any beef. I'll trade you uh, my, my half a hog for a quarter yeah. of, of your cow that you're yeah. fixing. Yeah. Let's make this trade. That's what I see more of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. When we first started talking about gentlemen farming, homesteading, my, my whole idea with doing this was, um, so living in Italy, they have a thing called an agriturismo. It's a farm to table restaurant. Everything uh, you eat yeah. is, is raised on the farm. I mm -hmm. wanted to do something like that. Yeah. So that's where this idea really originated for me. So what I wanted to do is a farm to table type restaurant, but I also wanted to have a store up front of a co-op nature where other area farmers yeah. and, and, sm and could bring in their canned goods, their crafts, their, you know, their goat cheese, their, their, um, yeah. their yeah. candles, their soaps, all of these things that they would need to come in and they could sell them there, their flowers, whatever it be. And we could make a general store on a kind of more, I, I don't know if I would say a consignment kind of thing, but more of where I have the storefront for you. I really don't need much from, you, you just kind of maybe pay a small, tiny little rent for a space, a space and yeah. you can sell, yeah. sell your stuff here. Yeah. And, and that, and that's kind of where I originally wanted to go. I've, I've kind of shifted away from that and uh, wanted to be more reclusive so to speak the downfall also there's two major downfalls to going and doing what we're doing first one is location uh, my location i have zero cell phone signal i am yeah. 15 miles from the closest town so nobody wants to to bring in a cable broadband to my house i my internet is through the satellite i might as well have dial-up modems again if, unless if you're uploading if you're downloading life is good the the other downfall is the money to get started. Yeah. yeah. We had to buy a tractor. Yeah. We had to buy implements for the tractor. Yep. We had to buy that. We had to buy the materials to build the chicken coop because there wasn't one there. And then buy there's the a huge, there's a huge learning curve to all this too, yeah, right? Exactly. And that's the, and, and for some people, the, the learning curve is bigger than others. Yeah. For me, it's not as large, but yeah, you've also had that learning curve. I, yeah. I, I mentioned earlier about our garden. I'm used to having very fertile soil. So gardening isn't that difficult in Nebraska. Right. In South Carolina with this clay, it's very difficult because it's uh, a different soil consistency, different conditioning. I got to I got to figure this out. And then we thought we had a big enough garden. Turns out we didn't. Now we got to make it bigger. So right now, our animal wise, we have two horses and we have the chickens that I spoke of in the spring. The, the next big project is to fence off a large area and look at getting cows and pigs. So with the pigs, do we buy a boar and a sow and start breeding our own and, and having piglets once or twice a year? Or every year, do we buy a cow and a, and a pig or twice a year and take them out and butcher those and, you know, and fill our freezer that way? You can't just jump into it unless you can just pay for all of this stuff. Right. Or right. you're in a situation like mine where you got to work a full-time job because this stuff isn't cheap. It's not free right. <laughs> and you got to pay for it. Plus you got to have the time to, to, to build up everything that you got to build up because yeah. Yeah. the infrastructure just isn't there. You have to write down on paper everything that you want and prioritize. Yeah. Chickens so, in, a, in a, in a garden were more important than beef and cattle yeah. or I mean, uh, cattle beef, and, and pigs. pigs. Yeah. So, so this is a, a build-up process to mm -hmm. get it to where it's going to end up being self-sustained, uh, right. and when you get to your retirement and post-retirement, mm -hmm. you'll be um, a lot more self-sustained. 
Yes. Okay. So that's exactly what the end goal is. Jim, I had a question because Matt told me something about a forging process that you have. And I've seen this scenario, especially with a lot of uh, former military and veterans. And what I've seen is they're getting out. And the next thing you know, they reach out to material providers. They're not just forging, like making their own knives, but they seem to be making like their own web gear, their own backpacks and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. Is that your process with forging? and, And how's that going for you? We go back to the homesteading aspect of the money. It's Mm -hmm. not cheap to get started in forging. And I'm still building my equipment. Ultimately, what my goal is with forging is to to, uh, coin the the young kids out there. It's my side hustle. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, and, uh, And just something to supplement my time. I've been doing it long before the popularity of things like forging and fire, For me, it's about the art behind it and the, and that artistry and that craftsmanship going back to what you were talking about before, Ed. Yeah. It it goes back to one of my previous statements of the difficulties I had with separating from the military. Yeah. These guys are their own bosses. They don't have to deal with a lot of the difficulties that I had, but also they know what it's like in those communities, the lack of the gear, but they also know that folks like myself really want some more of that gear, but we can't get um, a lot of times the NSN or the national stock numbers um, equipment. Right. So that's why they're starting their companies. Okay. What didn't work for me? What would I have ra- rather liked to have seen? So they go out and they, and they start building their own stuff these guys see where there's that niche and make gear that isn't going to fall apart after two deployments since nine 11 and, and around the 2008, 2009 timeframe, there's a lot more support for veteran owned businesses than there ever was before. So -hmm. guys aren't afraid to jump out and start doing these things. The VA has some amazing programs to help, get started with businesses, with loans and, and helping you with that. There's, there's a lot more of that entrepreneurial um, aspect than there was when I retired. I retired out of the, out of the military at, in 2008. The economy was crashing. Federal jobs were nowhere. People were too scared to start their own businesses. So you kind of had to take what you got. I think a big part of our audience, the intention for us anyways, is that it would be, you know, former law enforcement, military and so on. So that that is a big part of who we talk to. So that's it's important information. I like what you said about the the VA having those. Uh, yeah. You know, those services available. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. Let's go ahead and jump into now talking about the organization that you're representing today. First of all, the name of the group? The name of this organization is the United States Patriots Corps. I I don't want people to get lost in the name of Patriots Corps. Um, We're not a Patriots type organization. Mm -hmm. We are actually a bunch of veterans who have gotten together and it was started by some state guard individuals who no longer are able to serve with the state guard, but still wanted to serve the state. They got together and created this organization. And what our primary mission is, is to, to assist the state with search and rescue during disasters and things of that nature. We are a 501c organization and we are a nationwide organization. We have our main membership and our headquarters is right here in Chester, South Carolina. And we have a group that is growing in Mississippi and we have one in New Hampshire. We, like I said, we're, we do search and rescue. We do recognize a paramilitary type um, situation where we do have ranks. You do have to fill out an application. It does require a background check. You know, we're vetting people through, through those means. 
We do wear a uniform. We've got our own patches, but our base u- camouflage uniform is that of what the Army wears. We're, we're already starting next year. We're, we're going to really start getting our training going and getting ourselves established as that support model. In March, we're, we're going to get CPR qualified, you know, bloodborne pathogens, um, and get that training from the American Heart Association. In June, FEMA is coming in to teach a big course on wide area searches. Some things we want to do down the line is get more involved with Honor Guard, where um, we're, we're yeah. helping with funerals. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, flag ceremonies where the VFW and, and the state are like the um, here in South Carolina, the State Guard, there's only one team and they're located in Columbia to support the entire state. They And mm. most of the time they can't do it. So, and there's no other organizations to do it. So that's where we can come in and, and, and assist with that. Um, we, we have a fundraiser going on right now to, um, get a draft horse. I'll give you the link to Facebook. If you, yeah. if anybody wants to, um, to donate to this for law enforcement and, and military, some other things we're looking into is in those disaster areas, providing that executive protection. No, when you, when you, when you talk about that, that specific component security mm-hmm. for certain areas, is that, is that working alongside of FEMA or Red Cross yes. or somebody like that? Yeah. Probably yeah. National Guard too. Or National Guard. Yes. Yeah. And and also uh, assisting our, our uh, local law enforcement mm-hmm. agencies. Yeah. So we did an event, a recruiting event yesterday. While there, we met up with a smaller town that fire chief is, is also the police chief. Mm-hmm. But in what talking with him, if I'd have known you guys existed, I could have used you for our Christmas parade because I didn't have enough officers to support it. Yeah. We, we can yeah. we can go in and, and assist provide traffic control crowd control and and not and not in a in a force protection type you know we're armed and oh here we are kind of way but just that just that presence we we did have to take a, a brief pause in our efforts with events that occurred earlier this year not due to what we are or, or anything else but just due to our name we, we we took a step back and felt it was best for everybody involved. From what I saw yesterday, there's a lot more people interested in this than I, I originally thought. We want to target veterans more so than anybody else mm-hmm. because one, in the governing aspects of it, you know, we have a board of trustees. We, we have a board of directors. Um, all of us are veterans and veterans, we, we all have that unique skill that would love to bring in. If you guys have experienced, especially you, Ed, but I know as far as me is, I still want to help the community. And this is yeah. one way that I can do that. We also have less bureaucracy behind right. supporting this. It's easier for us to get out and, and assist. So that's that's what the U.S. United States Patriots Corps is all about. Yeah, it's cool. interesting you said you had to take a step back. There was a lot of fringe movements that were trying to espouse the name Patriot. It, it was getting polarized. But uh, Matt and I talked about this on a different podcast. I didn't know this till I moved to Texas, but we went out to Galva near Galveston one beach one day, and uh, we were talking to the residents there, and they said this last hurricane, they evacuated for a little while, and then they came back, and then the hurricane came in. There's actually a whole bunch of gangs of looters coming in, basically counting on you not being in your home. And it's and it's great you brought that that topic up, Ed. And and going back to our that protection um, element that we want to hopefully be able to establish later, it's for that very thing. Our founding members were when they were part of the guard, were involved with Hurricane Matthew. Mm-hmm. We're involved with some of those other hurricanes that have hit South Carolina, and they saw all that firsthand. But like this FEMA training that's coming up in June. Yep. We're also, we're partnering with our local fire departments and the local police departments to also get in and, and enjoy this training. And it's free. Yep. The, um, they're, uh, the instructor's coming from Texas A&M. Okay. Yeah. I got to I gotta ask, is this uh, Teeks, T-E-E-X, from Texas A&M? 
So it sounds very, very familiar. Um, uh, belong to CERT, Community Emergency Response Team. And uh, that was one of the things they did for us, this wide area search training. It was that three-day training class. Mm-hmm. And it uh, emphasizes that the lost person behavior book and yeah. things like mm-hmm. It's a fantastic course. Keep me posted on that. And then there's another course, and it's an acronym. And I, I don't know what the acronym stands for, but it's called Raiders. It's more of a higher level survival type training that is geared into this wide area search where you're going to be placed into situations. It could be we're assisting local law enforcement in finding somebody who's lost in, in a wilderness environment. And that's what that Raiders course does is it helps you to be able to to help augment that that searching of lost individuals. Yeah. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be from a natural disaster. It could be a hiker who gets lost. That's right. Lost and, you know, and we could go and assist yeah. with that. I wish I could devote more time to it. There's too many other things going on. Yeah. But as I said, you know, we're a nationwide organization. We do yeah. have our 501c and the, the end goal is for us to become a contractor for FEMA and yeah. actually get paid to assist. There's so, a lot of people ahead. that might have a lot of questions about the necessity of such a group. And there's so many mm-hmm. purposes and uses for such a group on the Southwest border States. We also had a group called ranch rescue. Yes. And it's not border patrol that they are there to help people that actually have ranch property right on the border. And their property is being exploited by mm-hmm. a lot of migrants that are coming over. So it, it could actually go into not only protecting the private property of people in the community, but also segue into that finding a lost person. Cause you could be trying to find somebody that was a, a migrant trying to cross over and they don't know where they are. And there maybe even their coyote is lost or whatever. And it's harsh territory yeah, right. out there. Mm-hmm. Jim, have you had any opportunities or has the group had any opportunities to work with those agencies yet? Or are you guys still just kind of building up? You were still in the building phase in the training phase. I've done an honor guard ceremony, this organization on Veterans Day. I knew I was going to do a a flag presentation, but I didn't really know much more than that. But it was for this organization. It's Quilts for Heroes. It's in partnership with Lowe's in this area. And they pick X number of (laughs) veterans and they make them a, a quilt and they present it to them in this ceremony. And we did the flag aspect for that. So there's a local company here in South Carolina in Gaffney that makes uh, American flags. Well, what they do is in the star section, in the blue section, if there's a blemish with the star, of course, they can't put it out on the line, but they give it to this company and the, and they make bags for the quilts with them. They've taken those stars and turned it into a meaning. So oh, okay. if it's missing a star, it, it represents those who have fallen and not come home Mm. if it's if it's missing you know a blemish in it or something it represents those wounded veterans that have have returned and so that whole quilt has a meaning so we did the flag ceremony for that and also did kind of a little video montage Is there a is there a particular direction or a, like a way that you'd like to see this organization grow? We would be wanting to look at it as different companies in the states with a brigade headquarters and branching out that way, where groups of people in in each state that can assist that state. But then, if it's something bigger, we can pull from our other companies and detachments to mm-hmm. assist and to be able to provide the support that a natural disaster or something of that nature would uh, would require. You know, obviously there's multiple other ways that you can serve in, in your communities and such, but the mm-hmm. search, search and rescue piece, especially in a, in a state and in an area like, you know, North and South Carolina, that's, you know, there's a lot of people who just, they have no idea what they're doing when they go out to hike into these mountainous areas, yeah. you know, yeah. and they tend to get lost more easily. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've got, three sons and and my two older ones actually live in the Gulfport, Mississippi area. Mm-hmm. And they were there for Katrina. 
um, it happened to be when I was stationed in Italy. So and it was 30 days before they got their telephone restored. But there were there were some lessons learned out of that. But it was 30 days before I could even talk to my my kids and the military wouldn't let me go to the area because they didn't know they didn't want other yeah. people getting lost, you know, and, and, I, mm. and I understand some yeah. of that that aspect behind it. But it's it, that was a very it was a very tense 30 days for me. Yeah, because yeah, I couldn't absolutely. talk to my kids. So we were there in March last year and where the houses were along the coast. They still haven't even started building up on that yet. Um, look at uh, just what happened over the weekend with in Kentucky and Tennessee, all the tornadoes mm -hmm. yeah. in the middle of the night that nobody yeah. knew for four or five hours that the, the amount of damage that was done, people lost, things that are lost. That's yeah. where these, these types of organizations. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. But there's that's where these types of organizations and growing up in Tornado Alley, I am very familiar with mm -hmm. with with the destruction of a tornado. Um, and then having spent the next 20 years or so in hurricane regions, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm very familiar with how a natural disaster can affect a community. Knock on wood, I've never been in a in a place where I've had to deal with something yeah. Right. Um, that major, um, the closest I ever came was in 1999 when that F five ran through Oklahoma, I was in Wichita Falls, Texas, um, where the, that F five, it ran from Lawton, Oklahoma, almost to Tulsa. And then it went North into Kansas. Mm. What um, year was, was that? 1999. That's the year, Matt. I told you in one of those podcasts, I was driving a truck at that time. I parked off the side of the road and I was going to end up going through Oklahoma and Tulsa. And my boss called me up and told me park off the park under an, o uh, an overpass. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, even, even then the wind was blowing the truck back and forth. And that was a truck yeah. that was loaded with vehicles. And I woke up in the morning and drove and I go, I went around the, the circle of Oklahoma city and there's this like yeah. a wasteland out there. Yeah. In those types of situations, organizations like we were just talking about the federal side of the house they don't they don't have enough people the mm -hmm. national guard or law enforcement and firefighters what is their mm -hmm. primary job going to be to go out and support that so yeah. now the national guard is short people yeah yeah and it's your it's manpower and it's warm bodies and it's extra hands mm -hmm. to do anything and it's a community effort and those groups like you said when katrina hit they even called the New Mexico Army National Guard to go out there. Mm -hmm. So you had Louisiana National Guard, I think uh, Mississippi, Arkansas, Texas, New Mexico. They are all pushing National Guard troops out to help in Katrina. So Virginia sent National Guard troops there. The city of Virginia Beach has a has a very, very good cert team that is good. has some national recognition. They they um, were called to support the Pentagon um, on 9-11. Okay. And they also, and they sent two or three teams to, to Gulfport. If a lot of those, that community effort is there, it might help curtail a lot of the looting that occurs during mm -hmm. those things. Because some of the, well, what a lot of people don't know is that some of the richer people in areas like New Orleans, when Katrina hits, they hire Blackwater to go yep. in there and, and Blackwater ain't messing around. Those guys, if, oh. if they catch you looting, they'll probably just shoot you. Are you act, like actively looking for new members at this point in time? And yes. if so, what what is uh, a way that uh, the audience might reach out to y'all? We have a website. You can go to the United States Patriots Corps.org. Um, and in there, you can fill out an online application. We'll, we'll get in and we'll contact you and uh, have, have a conversation. We do have an age limit. Um, we, we have set an age limit to 70 years old. If you're 70 <laughs> or over, you can still join the Elks Lodge. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It's like yesterday at the at the event. Um, well, what if I'm in a wheelchair? And and mm -hmm. I looked at and I said, just because you're in a wheelchair and you're 80 years old, doesn't mean that you won't have value for us. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of things you've done in life that 
we, we have never done and you can teach us. Yeah. We just want to meet you to see, but yeah. we, we try and, and keep, and keep our membership under 70 years old. Yeah. I mean, it makes, it makes sense. You're, if you're, if a valuable part of what you do is actively moving up and down mountains and, and mm -hmm. serving people in struggling situations and, you know, it, it's very difficult for, for certain, certain people to, to respond to that physically. You know, I think the parting shot that I have for this is um, just to, again going back to a core mindset of preparedness, whether it's an individual, a family unit, or the community effort with something like this uh, Patriot Corps thing. And there, you, you know, you you see the weaknesses in the government. Not necessarily that. I mean, the U.S. is a great country. But you just can't rely on the government for everything. We've we've said it, I don't know how many times, I think we say it on almost every podcast. So you do have to have some sort of self-reliance and self-sufficiency. And when there's a community effort involved in it as well, it helps alleviate a lot of problems that and issues that a lot of people, it's not, I don't think that they they take it for granted. I think it's that they just don't know that those issues are out there. Issues on the border, humanitarian issues. Um, like I said, after Katrina hit, Blackwater went in there and set up headquarters. Mm -hmm. and, and they started operating out there, according to uh, journalist Jeremy Scahill. And uh, what they were doing out there and everything, operating in that type of private security realm that they do, it kind of goes towards, um, you know, if you're going to have something going on in Kenosha. Mm -hmm. And do do residents and business owners have a legitimate reason to to want uh, some group outside of because the law enforcement and, and the core of uh, first responders and public safety are going to be stretched out. And, and we're, we live in a free country and, and you have a right to defend your property and everything. There's a lot of issues to talk about with this kind of stuff, but to a lot of the core of uh Jim's conversation, he's, he's segueing towards retirement. It's a great conversation on a lot of learning points. There's a, a, a big learning curve. It, it, there's a lot of investment and time, effort, and money. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, when if you can get yourself in that mindset and, and baby steps towards those kind of things, you can, as an individual, and then family, and then maybe outstretched towards community, become more and more self-reliant, self-sufficient, um, not dependent upon, you know, big brother government or anything else like that. And when something happens, you're more ready for it. That's all there is to it. You know? Yeah. That's yeah. my parting shot. This is one of the reasons I wanted Jim to come on the show is, is he has a lot of information, mm -hmm. but there, but there's some, some very interesting points that you made. One right off the top was entering into the, the homesteading, you and your wife sat down and said, what are the priorities we have? We, we know we kind of want to get away from the city. So just, just create a plan. So you create a couple of different plans that will help your family. And as, as Ed just spoke, you, maybe even your community to respond well and recover faster, right? I, I really respect the fact that you're trying to build an organization similar to something that I already uh, belong to, the CERT organization, in that the point is you're trying to help people. You know, I don't, I don't know if any, either of you have had the chance to watch. There was a, there's a, a series on, of shows that are out there. Um, but one in particular goes into the Olympic bomber. Oh yeah. And, and the fact that he goes up into at some point in time, he goes up into the mountains and he hides in North Carolina somewhere. And, and the, the militia from that area wind up protecting him initially right? Because they don't know him. They don't know what type of person he is. And once they find out what type of person he is, they go, okay, no, no, we're with the government now. We're going to help Jim. Like you're the organization that you're, that you're in. If you guys approach it in the right way and you're, you're coming alongside these agencies and helping, 
that's a that's an honorable thing. And so definitely appreciate what you guys are doing there. So that's that's my parting shots for today. And uh, with that, Jim, you've had a chance now. I think I think I can handle this parting shot. All right. I think I can handle this in in what we were talking about in, in our topics today. And, and, you, and both Ed, you and, and Matt have highlighted some of the things that in my head, as you're talking, I was formulating for my parting shot with, with the homesteading piece. An individual who wants to do that, you have to have the mindset of do it yourself. I have seen and heard about folks who lived in the big city and, oh, I can start a farm. And it was a couple and the other half of the couple can't leave the city because they didn't realize how much it was going to cost um, because they went in and, and took on more than one, what their knowledge could handle and mm-hmm. two, what their checkbook could handle. Yep. Now they're in a situation of if I can't do this by then, I'm done. And now mm-hmm. I've got to sell, sell everything. And I've seen that happen a lot. And also in your, so financial planning and the financial aspect of it is a huge, huge part of that. We're, we're looking at what's going on with our government now in the inflation. The cost in doing business is gone up. For instance, a, rail, a roll of hay, it cost me 40 bucks last year. Gas was cheap. We're, it's over $60 a, a roll this year because you can't afford to, to fuel the vehicle to cut the hay. Yeah. But the hay is nece- is necessary to put a to put a steak on your table. So the cost of doing life, you you have to understand that cost. You if you don't understand it, then you're then you're set up to fail. You're, you're not going to make it in that homesteading, and then that's where it, it gets a bad name. Also, with the homesteading, you have to learn how to do a lot more stuff yourself. For me, I can't I can't call Uber Eats and get wings from my favorite joint delivered. It's just not going to happen. You have to also learn to give up some of those comforts that you have that are right around the corner. Um, And you have to plan more ahead. You have to keep that in mind as well. Um, Now, granted, you could homestead a little closer to town, but still, it's not around the corner. If you're beyond the city limits, a lot of times you're not getting a delivery pizza. What are you going to do for your pizza? Learn how to make it. Just make sure that you've done your research. We mm-hmm. we re, we did two or more years of research and planning before we made that move. With the Patriots Guard thing, my parting shot on that is is don't judge the organization by the name. In most cases, we chose Patriots Corps because we are U.S. Patriots. We are veterans. Patriots go back way back to the Civil War. Patriots were minute Minutemen, and and Patriots are what helped us defeat the British and chase them away. Mm. Patriot is not a bad word. We need organizations like ours to help in those times of need. And when those people that don't want us today, all of a sudden are supportive of us because they need us. If, If your organization is doing amazing community work, then it's a good organization. And that's what we're building. Well, then let's go ahead and conclude uh, just with a reminder to the audience. um, Always be learning to respond well and recover faster. Uh, Thanks again to our guest, Jim Booth, for joining us. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. And until next time, this is Matt Marshall signing off. Ed Watson signing off. Thanks for being with us, Jim. We greatly appreciate your time. Thanks, guys, for having me. I appreciate it.